Welcome again to all of you for Bible study. Let's begin with a prayer and then we will get into the study. Praveen, as usual, we would expect you to lead us in the prayer. Father, we are in your presence, Lord, being thankful to you for uh, leading us, guiding us throughout this year, helping us to study your scripture together with our brethren, Lord. It has been such a blessing in our spiritual lives. And I do believe, Lord, our members have learned uh, more about you and it might have helped them to experience you intimately, your oh God, and it might have enriched that spiritual experience. And we want to thank you for whatever you have done till now. And uh, we would like to ask you, Lord, to help us so that we may continue it in the year uh, uh, 2022. Grant us your grace and help us to, so that we may be able to spare time and to learn, uh, learn your word and learn about you, Lord. Thank you very much for Pastor Dan as uh, he taught us throughout the year. You have spoken to us through him, Lord. Bless him abundantly. And uh, we are looking forward, Lord, that we may hear much more from him and uh, and other members also, Lord. May the hour we spend in your presence may be a time that, bring, that edifies us and brings forth blessing in our lives. And even today as we met here, Lord, I pray for your leading and guidance so that we may be able to recognize your voice. Speak to us through your servant, Lord. Our discussions may be meaningful and be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Praveen. And as you were praying, I was just reflecting. Uh, you know, I uh, hope that these studies have been helpful. Like Praveen mentioned, I hope it has uh, sort of continuously, you know, helping us to grow uh, and uh, be able to uh, sort of meaningfully discuss uh, some of these sometimes difficult subjects. Uh, at any time, I mean, if you want to suggest what you would like to, uh, you know, have uh, discussed in these forums, just send us a message that will always help us. Uh, I'm hoping that next year we would have greater participation in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of more people giving studies. Uh, so you don't get uh, utterly bored with my voice. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, uh, I'll always try to do my best to bring you, uh, you know, God's word as the Lord leads, leads me and leads all of us. Okay, having said that, we uh, want to move into our study today, which will be again a continuation of the series on spiritual discipline. I didn't realize that this uh, series would go so long. In fact, I am not, if I'm not mistaken, this, prob this probably has been the longest series. Uh, so, uh, which uh, I, I sincerely I hope that it, it has helped me to learn. And uh, uh, even as I prepare. Now, you must excuse me if you're hearing some dogs barking at the background. <laughs> uh, I've got a whole lot of these uh, in the yard and uh, I hope they'll quiet it down. But we are going to discuss worship. And obviously, when we talk about worship, that is something which is so familiar to all of us, isn't it? Uh, we are all very, very familiar with what uh, uh, the spiritual discipline of worship is. Perhaps it's, it's uh, one of the most common ones, very well recognized, and I think well participated. Most of us, if not all of us, worship. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, as we get into it, we would like to expand that understanding of worship. But to just get a few samplings of your, uh, your thoughts, your feelings, the question I want to ask is, what do most people have in mind when worship is mentioned? How do people, you know, identify worship? Give me some thoughts uh, that comes to your mind. 
<laughs> well, here in the in the US, uh, uh, when we talk about worship, it's basically the you know singing of praise and hymns uh, right. uh, during the service or before the service, and some sometimes uh, uh, an evening or or uh, some time is dedicated for for worship. It means just we are uh, uh, singing praises one after the other and and all that. Okay. Yes, I think uh, that probably is one of the most common understanding of worship, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, it, is all, it is automatically sort of connected with singing and praising. And yeah, and that, that, that's perfectly all right, you know. Um, so about anything else that comes to your mind uh, when worship is mentioned? Surya Murthy, go ahead. And, and, and you have thought, we'll, we'll come back to you. Surya Murthy, please uh, unmute and you can comment. It's constantly praying. It is constantly praising God's glory for all the creation. In whatever we see, whatever we hear, yes. we connect ourselves to God. Okay. The most most uh, inspiring thing in me for worshiping God is looking at God's creation everywhere. That is connecting it with science. As a student of physics, I look at the cement or brick lying here and there. But as we learn, we know inside it there are atoms, inside it there are electrons, the neutrons, the moving at tremendous speeds. This is so many facts like this, when you think of that, it, uh, it glorifies God. This is a form of worship, my form of worship. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. You have given us a scientific definition of worship, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, quite, I mean, uh, uh, it is very interesting to look at it that way, that you can praise God with, uh, you know, that understanding. Go ahead. Along with that, we have our own problems and trials, uh, difficulties. We keep on praying to God about those difficulties, trials. So this is also part of worship, I, be, I believe. Okay, yes. Uh, praising God and of course, maybe praying also. Yes. Uh, uh, Reka, you had a thought? Yes, I was just thinking that it is prayer and uh, meditation and Bible study, and then thinking about what God has done for us in the past, and all these things together make it worship. Okay. So you are mixing a whole lot of spiritual disciplines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, prayer and Bible study, these, these are all separate disciplines, but then all of this can constitute, uh, constitute worship. Yeah. Constitute worship. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, please unmute yourself for you. Yeah, your, your, your voice is a little choppy, uh, Bertie. I'm not sure, but uh, do give it a try. Let's see if we can hear you. Uh, to me, uh, worship is uh, praising, thanking, uh, acknowledging, and blessing God for his uh, presence. And uh, goodness and mercies, you know, and that he's uh, that uh, there's uh, none comparable to him, and that he deserves uh, de deserves to be uh, acknowledged, and to you know to to you know to acknowledge acknowledge who he is, you know, a righteous holy God, and that we and hence we bless, praise, thank, and acknowledge him, uh, and uh, you know submit to him. Okay. Yes, thank you, buddy. Yes, very true. Uh, that uh, you acknowledge. You brought in the you brought in the thought of thanksgiving, which is uh, I think uh, very important. Uh, that is a, a way of uh, uh, not only acknowledging but recognizing God's uh, goodness. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think those are very interesting thoughts. Franklin, you had a thought. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I go ahead, sir? Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir. Uh, uh, I, I will, in a nutshell, let me capture what the worship is all about. But I, I want to quote from William Temple's 
He is the Archbishop. He is the one who said, na, the church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of non-members. Here is a quote on worship. Sir. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God, unquote. Okay, well, uh, did you say that was William Temple? Yes, sir, William Temple. He's a William Temple Archbishop. I think Archbishop of Canterbury. I think. Okay, well, I think uh, that uh, is a, you know, encapsulates so much. <clears throat> and I'm sure we will be able to unpack a little bit of that uh, that you're talking about. Good, yes, I thought, uh, yes, all of these aspects, all of these uh, activities or perspectives, you know, uh, add to the concept of worship. Any other thoughts that you'd like to share? Anybody else would like to uh, bring in any thoughts on worship? Okay. All right. What we'll do now is, uh, as usual, uh, let me just share a few thoughts with you and then we'll come back for the discussion. Uh, when I asked the question, you know, what do most people have in mind when worship is mentioned? Uh, the the most i mean yes singing is probably the most common but going to church or you know church attending church services is many times considered to be you know a worship and most people will stop there and i think that's where uh, we need to go beyond that uh, definitely attending church and attending a worship i mean we call it a worship service is the, a part of worshiping God, but it is much more, obviously. What I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, want to do is expand the thought on worship and then briefly study two scriptures that talks about worship. Obviously, there is so much we can talk about worship, but we limit ourselves to these two uh, scriptures. Now, I think you will agree with all the uh, you know, thoughts that you shared with me that worship is not just a Sunday event, right? Uh, unfortunately, many people will tend to stop the Sunday event, right? But it is, it is not just a Sunday event. Uh, and uh, perhaps if I say that worship is actually a lifestyle, right? Uh, it's a lifestyle what our lives ought to be. Our lives itself is, uh, you know, uh, a worship of God, you know, and that is what I'd like to reiterate here. Uh, it is a dynamic, everlasting celebration of God. Just as uh, Franklin qu quoted William Temple, there are so many aspects to that. It's a celebration of God. Even Bertie mentioned about thanksgiving and adoration. Many of you mentioned praise and singing and uh, just uh, recognizing and acknowledging God for who he is. So it is literally a celebration of who God is, right? Now, from our perspective, I think perhaps what we need to recognize an important element of worship is that it's a continuous response to God. It is a continuous response to God's presence, to God's love, and to God's providence. And I thought that, that I think is something that we need to keep in mind. Worship is our response to God's presence and love and providence. And how do we respond? We respond, like many of you said, in praise or in thanksgiving, in trust, uh, especially as Suri Murti said, in times of trial, when you trust, it's a form of worship. When you trust God and, and depend on him, it's a form of worship. Obedience is worship. Uh, reflecting the light of Jesus in our lives is also worship. So, uh, so it is a continuous response, celebrating God's love, and providence and presence. And it's a response, like I said, in praise, thanksgiving, trust, obedience, 
and of course reflecting God's image in our lives. Uh, when, uh, when we respond to God, what we are actually doing is we are giving ourselves to God as he gives himself to us. And that is something I want to again reiterate. Remember, you cannot give yourself to him unless he has given himself to us first. We need to acknowledge that. Our response is because of what has God already done in our lives. We are not so righteous that we would see God on our own. And the scriptures make that abundantly clear that we of ourselves never will never seek God because we don't have the capacity to, right? And so we are responding because God has first and foremost given himself to us. So that is where I would like to bring in once again uh, the unique perspective that GCI takes, you know, the whole concept of relationship. So worship ultimately becomes or turns into a relationship, right? And what is that relationship? It is a relationship that is existing in God himself. Now, I want to use the Greek word, which we have used many a times, and I'm sure this must, this word must become uh, second nature to us in GCI. The word perichoresis uh, is, you know, a Greek word that uh, uh, explains or tries to capture, even though we cannot capture it in its fullest sense, the relationship that exists between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. Did you know that that is worship? I mean, uh, the relational dynamic that exists within the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, is like a form of worship. And that is the worship, I believe, uh, is something that we can participate in. Right. Uh, now, the word perichoresis, uh, once again, I won't take the time to go into a whole study of this, but uh, it is basically means to make room. Jesus Christ talked about mutual indwelling. He dwells in the Father, the Father dwells in him, and then we dwell in, in him so that we can dwell in the Father, right? I think we discussed that uh, the last time we, 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 had, we had met. So perichoresis is basically uh, meaning to make room uh, it is like a going around. It is like, you know, to give way to one another. Uh, it is like a choreographed dance. So we can use so many words, but none of these words will ever capture the real essence of it. So I believe, you know, we can bring this thought to help us understand this whole concept of worship. So worship is a, like I said, a consistent response to God's love and his presence. God's love comes first, and we are responding to that love. We are responding to his gracious presence in our lives. And so that, in a sense, is worship, right? Uh, and like I said, you do it in various ways. You do it in, you know, like all that you said about praise and all of those things. Now, uh, we should not forget the fact that we are in the presence of a, you know, a transcendent, mighty, sovereign God. So worship also includes reverence and admiration, adoration, devotion. So we must not forget those things, you know, even though we have a relational dynamic there, but uh, all of these come into play when we talk about worship. Okay, having mentioned uh, that, uh, let me just go to these two scriptures that I mentioned. I'm going to just refer to these two scriptures. Just do a very brief study. Obviously, it's not going to be, uh, you know, a lengthy study of these scriptures. There is much we can glean from these, but we will stick to the concept of worship from these. So the first one is Romans chapter 12. Many of you remember Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me read you verse 1 and part of verse 2. 
Here the apostle says, Romans 12, verse 1, I, uh, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And now notice what it says. This is your true and proper worship. He goes on to say, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a lot there that we can talk about. Let me just pick up a few thoughts. Notice uh, here, it is, it is the apostles seem to be describing true and proper worship. Uh, how does he describe that? He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And this is true and proper worship. When it says bodies, what does he mean? Obviously, it, uh, he, he means the totality of our being, right? It's not uh, limited to a physical body. It includes that, but it, in, it includes much more. It includes all of us, you know, in terms of our our uh, emotion, our, uh, you know, our, our, the, the, the depth of our beings, you know, as uh, we are given in the, in the great commandment, loving God with our, our mind, heart, soul, strength. So when he says, offer your bodies, it is the totality of our being, not truncated in any way. So he says, offer your bodies. In other words, that is a response, right? A response to move towards God. And that is an aspect of worship. Moving towards God with our whole selves is an aspect of worship. Now, how do we do that? How do we do that? Notice it says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, when it talks about a living sacrifice, the contrast is with a dead sacrifice. Right. And obviously the contrast is to the old covenant way of sacrificing. You know, you bring a dead animal or rather you bring an animal and kill it for offering it to God. But here the Paul apostle is playing with these words and he's saying, you give a living sacrifice. Right. Not a dead one. In other words, what he's saying is. You offer yourself, your bodies, your entire being with, you know, with a, it's a conscious, deliberate choice. It's a conscious, deliberate gesture to make room for God and to move towards God, right? Move towards him in adoration, in praise, in obedience, in communion, in fellowship, in conversation. And that's where prayer comes in. So worship is offering ourselves, moving towards God, you know, and uh, uh, moving towards him in all of these ways. And the apostle goes on to say, this is true and proper worship. Right? So in other words, what we are doing, what we are being told about worship is that we need to live in worship. Not just attend worship, you know, just to make a contrast with a Sunday event. We are supposed to be living in worship when we are in relationship and communion with God. That is finally what true worship is all about. One more thought from this particular scripture. He also says in verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. So he is connecting transformation with worship, with true worship. Be transformed by the renewing. In other words, what he's really saying is when we engage in this, when we offer ourselves to God, move towards God in praise and adoration and conversation and communion and fellowship, it transforms us, right? It transforms us. Now, pardon me for this, but I'm going to read you an uh, excerpt from an article I wrote. It's not very uh, nice for me to read my own article, but <laughs> permit me to do this, uh, for this for this particular time. Uh, recently, I wrote an article for, uh, we have a magazine or rather a, a, a monthly 
uh, what do you say, uh, series of articles, called, it's called the Equipper, and it's basically meant for the leadership to equip them with some thoughts on leadership. And I wrote an article on uh, measurables for LD churches, and I talked about worship. Let me just read you that, and I want to also read a quote from who I, uh, who I quote in my article. Uh, I, I write the following, healthy churches are regularly providing avenues for genuine corporate worship. Worship isn't something Christians do to get a weekly fix. It is to celebrate our precious savior. Worship should be trans transformative, not just to experience a temporary high. The psalmist reminds us that we tend to become like the one or things we ascribe worship worshipful trust, and I'm uh, quoting Psalm 115 verses four to eight. I go on to write, then it should be all the more a reason for us to participate in true worship so that we may conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And uh, I quote Richard Tan, one Christian author, and he says the following, the more we comprehend the beauty of God's nature in worship, the more worship will transform us into the likeness of his divine nature. This transformation not only changes us, but this change will positively impact the way we relate and interact with those around us. In other words, God is not only blessed by our worship, but others are blessed because we worship God. So I thought that was an interesting thought that uh, uh, that came in. Uh, so what I what I'm trying to uh, you know highlight here is that worship is transformative. It transforms us when we move towards God, and when we give, we move in praise and worship and adoration. It transforms us, and as we are transformed, we are a blessing also to others. Right, we become a blessing to others. So that is what I wanted to bring out from this uh, Romans chapter 12. The true worship is offering our bodies, our, the totality of our being, uh, moving towards God, in other words, and we move towards him in all of the ways that we mentioned. And, and that is transformative. So true worship transforms us into the very image of our Lord which is an ongoing process. That's why worship, like I said, is something we live in on a daily basis. It's not a one-time event on a week or on, on a weekday. Okay, that is one scripture I wanted to explain. Let me quickly explain the second scripture and then we will, uh, I'll give you some concluding thoughts. John chapter four and verse 23 uh, reads the following. A time is coming, and of course, this is Jesus, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is Jesus quoting, I'm quoting Jesus rather. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Right? Now, very interesting words that Jesus brings here. And here is another perspective that we can gather from what Jesus says, but let's look at the context. What is the context in which Jesus is saying, stating these words? If you remember, the context is the Samaritan woman, John chapter four, where he uh, is speaking to the Samaritan woman or having, having a conversation with the Samaritan woman. And uh, let me just read you some verses to bring the context. Verse 19 here the Samaritan woman says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and this is what I quoted earlier. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. Let me just give you a few thoughts. Once again, there is lots we can uh, take out of that scripture. But what we can understand, or in our context, what we are discussing today, that true worship is not limited to a location, Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim, where you know the, the, the Samaritans worship. It is not limited to a time. Example, Sabbath. You know, some people think you can only worship during Sabbath time. You can't worship on other times, right? It's not limited to time, nor is it limited to formality. You know, a particular liturgy or a, lit, a, a, a particular, you know, format, praise, prayer, preaching, right? Uh, this is not something that it is limited to that. In other words, the New Testament does not give us any prescription for a format of worship. So what Jesus is saying is we worship in truth and spirit and, and the context suggests that it is not limited to location. It's not limited to a particular time in a week or day in a week. It's not limited to a particular formality, right? So worship is not a one-time act on a Sunday morning or for the diehard Sabbath keepers or a Sabbath on a Sabbath morning. It is a continuous response when it is worship, when we worship in spirit and in truth. It is a continuous response, moment by moment interaction with our creator. It is, and I'm going back to those words, it is a communion with our, with our great God, right? It is a dwelling in and allowing to indwell. That is, in my understanding, you know, a worship, which goes back to the very, you know, word we were discussing earlier, perichoresis. <clears throat> uh, I would like to quote you uh, a, a, a writing from Carl Lanny. He says the following, because God is spirit, worship must be bound up with spiritual realities, not physical formalities. True worship is not limited in time, space, or ceremony. Right? And you remember Jesus said, they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, what, is, what would Jesus mean by that? Now, to me, to me, it seemed to, Jesus seemed to be saying that God is open for such worship. In other words, maybe you, you could say, and pardon me, I mean, I'm not limiting it to this, but uh, probably Jesus is saying, Father, the Father pays a special attention to such. Or in other, in other words, you could say, the Father is drawn to such worship. And he draws such into worship, right? He draws and is drawn to into an energetic, a spirited, an active, an ongoing, a dynamic, a zestful, a vigorous, Interaction. I hope you're impressed with those words. <laughs> no, I just took it out of a, out of the cinnamon cinnamon a synonym list. <laughs> but I thought I should mention that because I want us to understand that worship is this dynamic interaction with God, and which I can only explain by that word perichoresis. So, I think uh, as we wind up here wind up my, my, my discussion. Isn't it a privilege that God gives us such a, uh, you know, such a wonderful opportunity to commune with him, to have that interaction with him, to enjoy, you know, that celebration that we can do, we can experience on a regular basis. And let me end with, uh, you know, this, this uh, few verses in Revelation chapter 5 talking about worship. And I would like you, as I read it, just to capture that sense of interaction, that sense of dynamism that exists. Let me read you Revelation 5, and I'll end with this, uh, beginning in verse 11. It says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, 
numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Wow, what a bunch of synonyms there. Verse 13, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for laboring with me in those few thoughts, but now we are open for some discussion. So let's open up and uh, please uh, share your thoughts. Uh, please add to what I said. Uh, but I hope I was able to just expand that whole concept of worship. Uh, you know, that uh, we as Christians can, we are privileged to know. Uh, and it also shows us the kind of God we have who just enjoys drawing us into this kind of a dynamic, you know, interaction. Right. As usual, we are waiting for that first uh, <laughs> window to open. Right. Yes, Vanessa, go ahead. Okay, it's it's uh, it's actually true. What you say is that uh, worship is transformation. That uh, personally, what I can say is that uh, I have been worshiping in uh, different ways, like uh, going to church and of course praying. And but I feel that now, now the way I worship, there is a change in the way I worship, and there is a transformation in me. I have I have uh, come I mean come to know deeply within me the transformation that has taken place and uh, how I mean Jesus has worked in different ways. It's not that I have to attend a church on a regular basis, which I used to do, like every day I used to go, and of course that is not necessary. It's even even if I spend even five minutes or ten minutes in a day, just I mean really really heartfully praising him or giving him thanks. I feel that worship is any place, anywhere, any time. But if you're really sincere, I don't know, I was sincere, but transformation is there. <laughs> that I can say. Right. Well, <laughs> thank you, Vanessa, for your thoughts. Uh, just just uh, two uh, you know, perspectives I'd like to pick up. One is, of course, uh, I mean, don't uh, don't stop Sunday worship, bro. <laughs> We'd love for you to come and attend, uh, and you know, join with all of us, and we do it together. I mean, uh, uh, I understand that you know, worship is not just Sunday morning, but uh, you know, we'd love to see you in in, in church, uh, right? And uh, another thing is, you know, what what I was trying to explain is, uh, worship is like you said. If 10 minutes I spend in, you know, maybe prayer or this, uh, that's, that's perfectly all right. That, yes, that's perfectly all right. But what I want us to understand is worship is not just a, uh, just a 10 minute affair. It is a moment by moment living your life in interaction with our triune God. You know, like somebody said, I don't know who it is. I think Greg Williams spoke about this in his, one of his recent uh, uh, speaking of life thing, somebody uh, who was washing dishes in a kitchen, doing it with a sense of passion, enjoying it, and probably singing a hymn along with it is a form of worship. In other words, you don't stop worship after prayer. You continue in an attitude of worship. You know, I, I drive a car on many occasions. I am, I see something and I uh, I pray, and the way I drive my car is a form of worship. I don't scare the pants out of others, you know. I drive carefully. I, 
you know, all of, all of life is worship. So don't, uh, you know, uh, sort of truncate worship to just one small event. Does, does that help, Vanessa? I, I'm just trying to expand our thoughts on the whole concept of worship. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> yes, Anil, go ahead. Uh, it's like the scripture says, everything you do, do it to the glory of God. So, you know, whenever you're doing something, think of God, praise him, thank him. So uh, that is that is worship. Yes, that's a good scripture, Anil. Yes, thank you for reminding us on that. That's very good. And, I, and that also reminds me what Suryamurthy said. You know, when he looks at a brick, he looks at the atoms. Or he, <laughs> it reminds him of the atoms. I mean, that's, that's, that is a worshipful connection with our triumph. Because he is, of course, the creator of everything. So all of this, I mean, can you can you imagine enjoying a lovely meal, you know, amongst family or friends? That is a form of worship, you know. I hope I'm not, uh, you know, uh, mentioning something sacrilegious, but then all of this can be a way that we can interact with our God. It's a communion with God. Any other thoughts? Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, uh, what I personally feel is worship has two aspects, sir. Uh, there is the individual worship and there is also corporate worship, sir. Uh, let me read to you, sir, Hebrews chapter 10, 25. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the man is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see as you see the day approaching. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, corporate and individual, right? Yeah. Very true, uh, Franklin. Yes, uh, but our discussion is the spiritual discipline of worship. So I think we are basically focusing on individual worship, but you rightly, you rightly brought up the corporate worship, uh, but the, the spiritual discipline would probably... Uh, help us to focus a little bit more on our, you know, day-to-day, moment-by-moment interaction with God, right? But yes, thanks for mentioning that scripture. Okay, well, uh, I come on with some of your comments. Otherwise, uh, I was just thinking, you you know, I was reading uh, John 4 and, uh, 4 and 23, where I talked about, you know, worship is not limited to, to location and time. Any, any thoughts on that? Anything that you can add to that? Uh, uh, you know, we, we don't go to a temple now to worship because we ourselves are the temple of God. <laughs> right, and I, I remember somebody saying that when we when we assemble, it's like all the temples coming together, <laughs> rather than going to a temple. Right? Uh, any any thoughts on that? Anything you can add to that? What Jesus said that we worship in spirit and in truth. <laughs> yes, Rekha, go ahead. Yes, I was just thinking Jesus told Nicodemus you have to be born again. And that in itself tells you how transformed you have to be. Born, being born is in itself so painful. You have to change. I mean, it has to be different, so different that you're, you're not, uh, you're just following Jesus completely. And that is something very difficult to do. Right. Yes, born again, uh, uh, the whole, uh, you know, the change that should come over you in terms of living a new life, you know, taking a new birth as, you know, that, that's wonderful, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, the transformation in its, uh, you know, in, in its very essence. Yeah. Right. Is there anything you can, you can comment on? Uh, of course, we want to be careful when we say this, but you know, many Christians use uh, use certain artifacts like a crucifix or maybe a statue, uh, and they believe that it aids or helps them to worship. 
Uh, anything you want to say on that? Uh, because Christians do this, and uh, some of them, they think that a cross is necessary for them to worship. What, what are your thoughts? Or a picture? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, God forbids idols, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I mean, uh, 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 yeah, uh, it, it says that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, right? I mean, uh, yes. But uh, some people seem to indicate that, you know, that they are not worshipping the idol, but they are worshipping, uh, it's it just a, a an aid. Yeah, facilitator. Facilitates, right? Any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? No. Uh, would you say it's wrong? Would you say it's, uh, I mean, uh, like I can, I can, I can look at a, a crucifix and it brings thoughts into my mind. Uh, you know, I can read a verse, but I'm not worshiping the Bible as a book. Some people, you know, actually kiss the book and uh, put their forehead to it. But uh, any thoughts on that? I'm just trying to expand your <laughs> conversation. Anil, you had a thought? No, I mean, one can argue both ways, but uh, uh, I, it's better if we can think of God without these, uh, uh, you know, idol and, and mm -hmm. Ellen, I think come to think of it, even a crucifix or a cross, isn't that also a symbol of an idol? I mean, we are uh, worshiping in the form of an idol. <laughs> Although most churches have a, have a crucifix and the altar and so on. But right. I wondered sometimes. Right. Uh, uh, I, let me I mean, see if this makes sense. Uh, many people regard that as a symbol rather than an idol. Right? Now, you can make the symbol into an idol. You know, it can right. become an idol. But if it is symbolic, uh, I'm presuming that, uh, I mean, uh, do you think that's okay? <laughs> Any thoughts? It's your personal conviction, I think. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, Surimurthy has a thought. Go ahead, Suri. Yeah. I don't use crucifix or cross. But uh, when I see people using the cross or the crucifix, I do not condemn them. I feel appreci I appreciate them. And some way or other, they are bringing God into their minds. Okay. When I see when I see a photograph of a church in somewhere in China having a cross on that being demolished by the Chinese, then I remember there have been people who have been thinking of God, mm. Christ. So, yeah, I, I, I do not know how to describe that. I do, I do not condemn them, but I feel appreciative. At right. least, to some extent, they are thinking about God. Okay, fair enough. Yes, Rekha, go ahead. Well, the symbol, the cross is a symbol of death, but when Jesus rose, he made it a symbol of the living that he rose and therefore people worship him as the resurrection more than the symbol of death. Okay. Okay. So what you're saying is that the cross can also uh, be symbolic of the resurrection? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Well, I suppose it's inclusive, right? I mean, uh, yeah. there was a death before the resurrection. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but I, I, I take what you say. Uh, Sorry, Murthy, I mean, uh, there are people who might regard that symbol, uh, uh, something which can be very, uh, you know, stimulating for them or spiritually inspiring for them. For anything. And I'm presuming that, uh, you know, there is no need for us to condemn that. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so we have to make a distinction between symbolic as well as, uh, you know, uh, an idol. Now we have to be careful, like I said, that the symbolic does not become, uh, uh, you know, idolatry. Mr. Rao is looking very grim. I don't know if he has, uh, if he's very upset with what we are discussing. 
<laughs> Sarav, any thoughts? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you need to unmute yourself. Saying. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, well, I suppose uh, I hope that uh, what we discussed was helpful uh, in terms of uh, just, I, I hope I just expanded the whole understanding on worship the way we need to. And if anything that we can take away, we need to keep in mind, it is a uh, a, reg a constant, consistent interaction with God. That is our worship. And we, we do that, you know, in praise and adoration and devotion. And of course, uh, even sometimes, uh, you know, with a sense of uh, a pain in our hearts, you know, emotional pain that we come to God. It's a, it's a way of uh, recognizing his loving presence with us. So, uh, so let's leave it at that for the moment. Uh, thank you very much for uh, participating. And uh, we are going to take an extended break, uh, like I mentioned. So we're going to see you in uh, the month of January when uh, we will resume this. And if you don't mind, I will complete this the series on spiritual discipline, and then we can think of others. In the meantime, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share and any uh, subjects that you would want to deal with, maybe we can put it all together and see how we can plan the year ahead, uh, the next year. Is that okay, Praveen? Any thoughts on that? Any any suggestions you'd like to make before we close? Uh, Praveen, did you? Could you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you have any thoughts or suggestions, please share it with us. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Praveen, go ahead. There are a few thoughts about the word trip. Maybe those are a little big, so we'll share next time. Okay. All right. Both with iconography. Uh, this uh, using these symbols also can be related uh, uh, taking a survey through Old Testament to the New Testament especially how the perspective of worship has been changed and uh, what is the uh, what is <clears throat> uh, what is the perspective that we can take having considering God as a Trinity and considering other stuff so maybe when we have time Perhaps we can explore. Sure. All right. <clears throat> that sounds good. Uh, we can continue to <clears throat> expand on what we have done. Okay. Well, uh, allow me to close in prayer today since we are <clears throat> going into this break. Uh, <clears throat> let me just pray and uh, just thank God for his uh, loving grace. <clears throat> Gracious, loving Father, oh, how we thank you, Lord, for sustaining us through this year, <clears throat> even as uh, we have been able to do Bible study quite regularly, uh, we thank you so much for uh, continuing to uh, spur our discussions, bringing thoughts and helping one another with expanding our understanding and knowledge. Thank you that our discussions have been so uh, elucidating and friendly and uh, uh, sometimes uh, you know, even though we might not all see it in the same way, but we are bringing them all these thoughts to help us understand and grow in your knowledge. Thank you for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving all of us the, the uh, stamina to continue to attend these Bible studies. And I suppose we have laid a platform, Father, for more and more interesting discussions and thoughts uh, in the coming year. Lord, I just want to ask a very special blessing on our brothers and sisters who have been attending this study on a regular basis. Take care of them, Father, as we uh, slowly end this calendar year. 
protect them from the virus. And uh, what a wonderful opportunity it will be if next year we can meet somewhere, somehow, all of us. We look forward to the time because that opportunity to fellowship is something which you have given us. Uh, uh, it's a great blessing you've given us. So, Lord, give us that opportunity that we, where we can meet. And in the meantime, as we close out for the year, we just, uh, even as we thank you, we ask for your blessings upon all of us, on all of families, and uh, continue to inspire us to grow and help us to maintain the faith, Father. There is a lot of attack on our faith. There is dark forces that continue to uh, uh, attack the church, the, the churches and the church. And we know of so many Christians who are falling into all kinds of vices, and all kinds of wrong thoughts, a lot of wrong teaching, false teaching going around. Please protect your people, Father. Protect your church that our church may may withstand these dark forces that continue to try to uh, destroy us. But we know that the church, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. Thank you for that, uh, for that assurance you give us. So I, I pronounce a blessing on all of us, Father. And, uh, and I do this in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs>